So here's the thing. Today, we're going to do something very, very special. We're going to have a fireside chat with a real estate icon, Jim Wahlberg. Jim Wahlberg is an amazing real estate agent based out of the San Francisco area, and I think you're going to love this episode. Now, before we get into that, I want to make sure that if you like this and like what we're doing, make sure you do a few things for me. Number one, like this video. Number two, subscribe to our channel. And number three, make sure you comment down below. Now, without further ado, let's get into this. Hey, this is Gary Kreth with The Chris and Gary Show. And today I am delighted to be joined by one of my favorite all-time people in life and certainly one of my favorite people in real estate, Jim Wahlberg. By the way, if you have not met Jim, I just want to give a quick introduction to who this man is and who he has been and who he is becoming. Jim is a dad. He is a husband. He's a realtor. He is a community volunteer. He's an athlete. I've seen this in action. This man is a machine. He's a wine detective. He can kind of talk about that. He's a sailor. He actually talked to me about buying a sailboat. He's a passport stamp junkie, and he is a cancer, not survivor, but a thriver. And by the way, if you didn't know that about him, you probably don't know this about him either. He is among the top 200 real estate influencers mentioned by Inman News. He is a winner of the Inman News Innovator Award. He is the number one, okay, in my terms, of the top 21 most interesting people in real estate by Inman News, and he is a sought-after speaker at worldwide conferences regarding growing a real estate luxury business and practice, and that's what we're here to talk about. Jim, welcome to the show. Man, I'd like to meet that guy. <laughs> well, look in the mirror, buddy, because there he is. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, Gary. Thank you very much for inviting me, and it's an absolute honor. Well, it's an honor to have you here, my friend. I know normally we like seeing each other in person. Um, right now, we're doing this virtually. I would love to have you sitting here by my side so we can have this fireside chat. But what we're here to talk about today is luxury real estate, everything about luxury real estate, because I think this is such a hot topic to a bunch of real estate agents who are either entering the real estate market, who have been in a little bit and they look to other luxury agents and they're like, mm, I aspire to be that. Or even real estate agents who have like kind of dipped their toe in the water of luxury real estate and said, I want more of that. How do I get more of that? Like, I like that a lot. And so we're here to ask you a lot of questions, Jim, because you are in my mind and probably yours a luxury real estate agent. But I'm going to ask you the questions. I'm not I'm not going to put words in your mouth. We're, we're going to ask you the questions and see if this is true. So first, Jim, there is a very popular term in the real estate industry, and this is luxury real estate and luxury realtor. What does this mean? Well, this is a this is an interesting question, Gary. The the industry, I, I think, defines luxury real estate as a top 10% of your current market. I think that's a standard, uh, a standard uh, definition. Uh, the challenge that I have with that, just because of the zip code that we live in, hmm. we bought our house for $460,000 32 years ago. <laughs> uh, it's now worth $2.5 uh, Right. Uh, it is in the category of luxury real estate price point in our community. I, I just can't imagine. I mean, we live in a 2,800 square foot, four bedroom, three bath house in a cool neighborhood. Uh, I just don't define where we live as a luxury real estate uh, property. But in the definition, it does. If we're looking in our region of what that actually looks like, uh, it's probably, um, you know, a very special house in the, in the three and a half to five million range. Uh, and it's generally owned by a C-suite executive uh, or an entrepreneur. Uh, so when we're defining luxury real estate, uh, it's not our house, but it, in from the NER's perspective, it is. You know, I, I, I like what you just said, because here's the thing. 
I sold an investment property in Austin not too long ago. And it was in Clarksville, which if you're familiar with Austin, is very close to downtown. And I can tell you the house itself, is it's a complete teardown. It's 1,100 square feet, like complete teardown. Somebody actually bought it from me and lives there. I'm like, okay. But the fact is, is I sold it for over a million dollars. And the, the, the quality of life there is not what I would call luxury. But the dirt, that's luxury. And so, you know, defining luxury to me seems more like lifestyle than price point. Is that something that you would agree with? Well, if you're talking about uh, real estate, uh, yes. So the property has got to be something special, something that uh, allows that lifestyle, that luxury lifestyle for the owner. But I, I'm going to divert uh, just a little bit, Gary, in your in your questions. W- the way that we are serving our clients, uh, and it's so funny, I, we don't even imagine that we're serving them and they're a luxury real estate client. When I step back, from it, I, I understand they are. Uh, and they're expecting a different experience, uh, I think, than your typical first time home buyer. Uh, if you think, Gary, about the way that you and your wife uh, travel through life in the world, uh, you have a, a particular expectation of what that experience is. Right. You may not have a car in Italy right now, but you may uh, use an Uber uh, to get to some place for an evening uh, that you dial it up on your phone and it shows up and it picks you up and it takes you there. And then you find another one to take you home. Uh, we don't even think about it, about the daily experience that we are having that is going to be a completely different experience for most of the people buying real estate. How is it that we can have the experience be a luxury experience as opposed to the tedious uh, paperwork stuff that happens in our our space? Uh, And that's what we work for every day is how can we we surprise, delight, and dazzle? Uh, And those are our three words that we use. Oh, say that again slowly. I want everybody here to Really document. You just you just drop three golden nuggets right there. Drop drop these again because if if people can in, implement this into your business, this is what exudes the experience that luxury experience that people are looking for. What is that again, Jim? Surprise, delight, and dazzle. What does that mean to you? So so when you're out, well, first let me ask you this question: Do you consider yourself a luxury real estate agent? It's so funny. Uh, I don't. Uh, it just happens that the space that we're in, uh, and Gary, it's evolved. I mean, 33 years ago when I started my real estate practice, uh, I was dealing with first-time home buyers. Sure. I was dealing with people that are buying uh, a condominium or a townhouse or whatever. Uh, so there was no intention to have it turn out the way it's turned out. But how it's turned out is long game of serving those people over and over and over again, where we have in our database of about 900 families, we have many of them that have had 10 or more transactions with us. Uh, so it it's, wasn't intended. It's, it's evolved in a way that um, maybe is organic, that it, the way it could evolve organically for anybody. That, that's really interesting that you say that because so many real estate agents ask me this question, and that is, I want to be like that person. I want to be like Jim. I want to be like my brother, Jonathan, who is a luxury real estate agent. I want to be like you guys. I want to sell those homes. What I'm hearing from you is that for you, at least, there was no fast track. It was the slow track, the slow and steady, but boy, did it pay off because what you did is you made sure that you served those people, you delighted them, and that you dazzled them over and over again. They referred you business. You continued to build business as they move up. Can you explain that process that you did? And how is it that you made sure that they always came back to you? 
How is it that you made sure that when they had a friend or a family member or an acquaintance who was looking to buy or sell real estate, that they made sure that Jim Wahlberg was top of mind? How did that happen? And how did you progress up over the past 33 years to become the icon that you are? Oh, man, I don't even think I'm an icon, Gary. So, Well, I so you know what? I'm, I'm just going <laughs> to share this with everybody here. Jim apparently doesn't have any mirrors in his house because he doesn't understand who he is to the rest of us. And, uh, and I appreciate very much that humility that you have, but you do need to understand for the rest of us in the industry is that we look up to you as that icon of, wow, I want to be like, I want to be like Jim. And so and I, and I really do appreciate you. And I, you know, I love you so much, but man, you are that icon to so many of us. And, and you do it in a sense of service. But I think that that like is pervasive throughout your entire life with your customers, with real estate agents, when you're speaking from the stage, when you're like sharing your worldwide views, this is who you are. But how did this progress? How do you stay in touch with these people? How do you delight them uh, in order to keep that service coming back over and over and over? Great question, Gary. Uh, as you had presented it, uh, I've had some time to think about it. Uh, the way that we describe it, Gary, is that we're in the long game uh, as opposed to the transaction business. We're in the relationship business. And unfortunately, uh, 90, 95% of our colleagues, I think, are in the transaction business. Would you take two seconds, just, just share with us, or two minutes, share with people, if they're not familiar with the differentiation, I'm very familiar with this, it's a huge differentiator. What is the difference between a transactional realtor and a relational realtor? The uh, transaction realtor is out of business every time they close an escrow. Uh, and their idea of going to find another transaction is to go and host an open house and see if they can uh, snag a buyer. The business we're in is uh, the relationship business. To give you an example, uh, when we are uh, at the closing table, most of our colleagues is last time they'll see these people in a long time. Uh, we have an addendum that we bring out at the closing table and let them know we forgot to have them review this and sign this as part of the documents. It's on a, uh, a California Association of Realtors Addendum A. And it says that uh, we're invited to every party you have at your house for the first year. Uh, and uh, second and third year on are optional, depending on our behavior. Uh, and <laughs> depending on your behavior. I love it. <laughs> and we let them know we're like a bad cold. Uh, we just don't go away. So when you're talking about the, um, we call it, Gary, the positioning game. The positioning game, if I said to you, Campbell's, what would come into your mind is soup. Campbell's won that game. Uh, we did not give Campbell's permission. Uh, they won the game from a constant, constant marketing positioning game plan to have their name and soup be synonymous. So we have a positioning game plan where we touch our database at least 40 times a year. Uh, and it's through postcards, it's through uh, phone calls, it's through, uh, it's through text, it's through drop bys, uh, it's handwritten notes. Uh, we have an entire system in place. So it doesn't matter if an escrow closes, we're still in business. We're still implementing our touch program to our database. So we call it our touch program. How can we touch them in very, very significant ways? For instance, uh, Father's Day was just this uh, few days ago, or this month. Uh, I have a opinion that uh, there's a difference between, oftentimes there's a difference between fathers and dads. Uh, so I sent out a text personally sent out a text to over 200 of the dads in our database that day, that morning. I got up at six o'clock and started. It took me two or three hours to do this. 
but it was a way for me to acknowledge them as a dad and thank them for the work that they've done as a dad and they should be celebrated today. Well, that would be an example of a high touch moment that hopefully, and the response that I received back was unbelievable. Uh, so it's an example of how it is that we're touching our database all the time. So what, what I love, what you just talked about is so much about what we preach at the paperless agent and with our marketing club is that when we're reaching out to people in our network, sphere of influence, database, I mean, whatever people want to call it, I don't care what you want to call it. it there are relationships when we're reaching out. Don't you don't, like if you're texting or calling, you don't have to bring up real estate. And in fact, it's even better if you don't, because if you're messaging them monthly, if you're on social media, they're seeing that. If you're sending them an e-newsletter about real estate, they're seeing that. If you're sending them a market update, they're seeing that. When you message them directly, have nothing to do with real estate because we believe through the messaging that we've done, we've built enough trust, they know who we are. And if a real estate conversation is to be brought up, let them bring it up. Don't force your real estate down their throat. Care about them as a human being first, and then it comes back. Well, I wish we'd had your coaching uh, uh, 25 years ago, Gary, uh, but there's nothing that we communicate uh, it's about nothing is about real estate. It's right. about them. Uh, it is all about them. I've got a, a hundred phone calls that I have to make every quarter. Uh, those phone calls will be very simple. Gary, hey, Jim Wahlberg, uh, I'm just thinking about you today and I'm checking in what's going on. And that is the entire opening of the phone call. And I then get to hear a very interesting catch up story. Uh, since we last spoke it has nothing to do with real estate. That's beautiful. And, and, and that is the difference between a transactional and a relational realtor relational. Re, like it's all about relationships. It's not about the transaction. And in fact, here's the thing. If the transaction never even happens, the relationship is still there. And that's the beautiful thing. Now, Jim, we get a lot of questions from from real estate agents and they they always ask how do i get to that level how do i become that luxury real estate agent what i'm hearing right now from you is that from your experience it's a long game is that treat people right take care of them can you re can you remind the audience the three terms that you said about how you take care of those customers. Surprise, delight, and dazzle. Surprise, delight, and dazzle. So you do this over and over and over again. You stick with them as they build up because of course, the natural progression of life is most people, as they get older, they make more money. They have kiddos, um, they get married, um, they, they need a bigger house, they need a more expensive house, they get, um, uh, they get um, raises and they move up and they make more money. And so they get bigger and more expensive houses and their friends and family members do the same. And so then they refer them to you. So this is how you built your real estate industry or you, your real estate business. Is there anything else that you would recommend to people? If like, if, if I've been in the business for three to five years, gosh, Jim, what would you say to me? As a real estate agent, I have a good business. I'm a relationship styled realtor. I'm taking care of my customers, but I don't want to wait 33 years until I'm hitting that that luxury peak. What would you say to that real estate agent? As I originally said, there was probably not much intention for how this has turned out. But if I was going to be intentional about it, here's some ideas. The phrase that I use is put myself in opportunity's way. If I'm well, let, Let's pause right there because this is, you and I have had so many conversations about this. We actually just talked about this yesterday. Put yourself in opportunity's way. Please like focus on that, drill down on this because this is really, really important for everybody here listening to understand 
what this means and how you can do this in your business for not a huge investment. Yes, the, the, the issue about somebody that's been in a business three or, or to five years, Gary, that is wanting to uh, jumpstart into a different price point, uh, oftentimes it appears that it takes a lot of money. Uh, and I, I would suggest it doesn't. The two or three ideas that I would throw out to, to your audience. Uh, for instance, uh, the country club that Anne Marie and I belong to, uh, I'm not a golfer. Uh, I used to play a lot of tennis. I'm not a tennis player anymore. Uh, I generally use a spin bike as my exercise. But the country club in our area is really a great group of people. So we are social members of this country club that allows us to do anything that we want at the country club other than golf and tennis, uh, which is okay with me. So we are at that country club for social events. We're at that country club. We, we in fact, we are tomorrow night. We have a dinner with that we're hosting with some clients uh, that we think they would really enjoy the experience, and they're excited about going. But it costs us about two hundred fifty dollars a month uh, as our social membership at that country club. And so that's holy an idea. cow. I, I mean, I, th this is fascinating because my brother is a member of a country club in Austin. Uh, his initiation fee was $45,000 and now he pays like 850 because he's members of the golf, the tennis and everything. But what I asked him is where do you meet these relationships? He said some on the golf course, but really mainly in the country club, having dinner, having meals, the social stuff. And you can do this for $250 a month. Yep. And it's uh, it over the years. I mean, it's been years that we have, participate in the country club and it's it's uh, it's a wonderful experience and the people are wonderful we we know the staff by first name they know us by first name uh, they make introductions for us another uh, another avenue is uh, uh, charitable uh, organizations uh, oh, one okay. of the, yeah one the, of the which makes a, a lot of sense now now Jim I, I just want to warn everybody when a lot of real estate agents hear about, well, you need to get in, involved in these charitable events. A lot of people are thinking, gosh, I need to spend money like $10,000 a year to contribute, to donate, to get in there. But you don't. How do you, how do you participate in these charitable organizations in order to meet other like-minded people? Well, the one that uh, is important to us is the food bank. Um, it's just amazing. In our, in our region of the San Francisco Bay Area, the food bank in our region serves 250,000 meals a month to hungry people. Wow. And it just blows my mind that in the midst of the affluence that, we're, that we live in, uh, that there are a lot of hungry people. So I want to be involved in addressing that issue. For instance, our team uh, is at the food bank at least once a month stuffing boxes. Uh, we, we, are, we want to be actively involved. Uh, we're actively involved in fundraising for them. They've asked me uh, several times to be on their board of directors over these years, over these decades. Uh, so the food bank is something that's important to me. Uh, one of the things that I would recommend to our uh, to the audience is if there's a cause that's important to you, get involved. Uh, there could be, I don't know what it is. It could be literacy. It could be, I don't know what, uh, but just get involved. There's lots of nonprofits around every community. Uh, this happens to be one that's important to us. I love that because the more you get involved in these organizations, these charitable organizations, um, or even the, the community uh, or, or, the, or the country clubs, whatever it may be, is you're getting around like-minded individuals. And what's amazing about that is it sparks conversation. It sparks relationships. It sparks the opportunity to build on something that is so difficult so many times because what we're talking about here is in relationships, as you're building relationships, uh, the biggest thing that advances a relationship forward is trust. And the fastest way to build trust is through common interests. Oh, gosh, Jim 
Jim loves to work uh, alongside other people at the food bank so that we can feed people. I do too. Let's go talk. Jim, you want to grab coffee? Let's go talk about this. That's how stuff happens. And I love the way that you're talking about this is that I think so many people have this, um, this, this wrong belief about kind of breaking into the luxury market as, well. I have to buy the right car. Like I got to go buy that Lambo or that Ferrari or that Lexus or Mercedes or whatever. I got to cruise around. I got to hang out at the most fancy restaurants and do this stuff. You don't have to do that. What you need to do is just reach deep inside of you, find out what's important to you, and then you go find other people, other individuals who have those same beliefs, wants, and desires. And I love that so much. So if you don't mind, Jim, I'd love to take a quick transition and let's talk about the luxury customer because you know, I, I once heard this quote from somebody that I hired at one of my real estate brokerages a long time ago. And he told my team, he said, do you know that the only difference between a luxury client and a first time home buyer is the number of zeros in their bank account? And he firmly believed that. He firmly believed that everybody is exactly the same except the wealthy the luxury client have more zeros in their bank account. Can you share with me your thoughts on that? Well, I don't agree with that uh, quote. Um, if that is a place to start, um, and it's it's difficult for me, Gary, to to keep talking about the luxury client, but I understand that that's a title that uh, of the type of clients that we're involved in. I don't think about it that way. The difference, a massive difference, is their expectations of service. Uh, massive difference. Uh, if we're dealing with the um, the CEO of a major company in the San Francisco Bay Area, his expectations of an experience of dealing with another professional is different than a first-time home buyer. Uh, we are... Uh, we are actual colleagues with them as opposed to selling them something. The title that I have on my business card is real estate wealth advisor. Uh, that is the title I have on my card. Uh, and it's because we're in the business, not just of helping them buy and sell real estate, but how can we assist them with uh, their real estate investment portfolios? Uh, how can we assist them as Jim, Jim can I can I pause can I pause you right there because you just blew my mind. This is such a huge distinction. Is that you said we're not realtors, we're not service providers for them. We are colleagues first. Th this is a major differentiator of what you're saying to what everybody else in the industry says. And the importance of what you just said, I think um, it, it necessitates a little bit of review there, because to become to to state or believe or um, have on your business card that you are a colleague of theirs versus a servant of theirs is vastly vastly different, and I think I think that's a major differentiator that everybody can instantly like today take away from this. And I, I just want to spend maybe three or four minutes to dissect this, Jim, because this is really huge. I've never actually heard you say this before, but it's huge. Can you share with us, like, what is your thinking behind putting this on your business card? What is your thinking behind, no, I'm your colleague. I'm not a servant. What What is your thinking there? Well, I, I don't know how it's evolved that way, Gary, but uh, we are there. We are their colleague. We're standing beside them. Uh, we actually uh, uh, have the qualifications to be on their board of directors of their company. They have a team. Each of us have a team. Uh, Anne Marie, my wife, and I, and my business partner, Anne Marie, we have a team of, of advisors. Uh, we look at it as a team. We don't look at them as servants. Uh, we're all in this together, and uh, they're supporting us in areas that are important to us. We value that, and we do the same with the real estate space. 
uh, with our uh, corporate clients. I mean, the, almost every one of our clients are in the C-suite of some corporation. So we are, we are their colleague. We are their trusted advisor that uh, we, we really hope that we're indispensable for them. You're right. And, and, and for me and for most realtors, this is a mindset shift is that getting out of the mindset that I'm your servant, your, your servant, and that I'm sitting here, you know, I think for most realtors, we're like dialing for dollars. It's just our next transaction. I got to make this happen. And instead, this is a mindset shift to where, oh, no, I am your equal. And in fact, I'm going to become part of your advisory team. You have your financial advisor, you have your CPA, your accounting team, and you have your real estate advisor, and you have your other advisors over there. I'm part of that equal team to help you get where you want to go. And I love that because all of a sudden it takes the kind of, um, I don't know, the fear out of, uh, am I good enough to serve this client? Am I good enough to do this? Am I worthy enough of this? It's like, oh, hell yeah, you are. And here's why. Because we're all equals. It doesn't matter where we are in life, Jim. You know, in fact, you have this wonderful quote. Gosh, I, I wish I could. You're going to have to bring it up. Is that we're all walking each other somewhere. Can you share with us that quote? We're all here walking each other home. We're all here walking each other home. Yeah. And I, I, I get chills when you say that because what that says to me is that there's no difference between us. We're all humans. We're all working towards the same thing. Like, and, and, and we're all working to work, to walk each other home. I mean, that's a little more existential than what we're talking about here, but it's also very important for us to understand is that, just like you and me, we're all here to walk each other home. Yeah, and there's also a phrase that's important to me, Gary, is that I don't want to ever forget my humble beginnings. I think that sometimes in the real estate space, uh, some folks have some uh, some success, and then somehow they think they're important. Uh, and I mm. know I'm not. Uh, I come. I I can't tell you the humble beginnings that I've come from, and I don't want to ever forget that. Uh, when somebody attempts to think that they're important, it means that they're important, and I'm not. Uh, and I want to make sure that I understand my place in this world is really a very humble place, and I I do I work very hard to provide a service to to our clientele. Uh, that is beyond anything that they could ever get from anywhere else. And, and that's what we do. But we work very hard at it. But I do not want to ever think I'm the equal of the CEO of one of the major corporations in San Francisco. Uh, I'm just very humbled to be a part of their advisory group. What I'm, what I'm hearing, to, to sum things up and, and to wrap things up for everybody here, is that if you're looking to become, or if you aspire to become a luxury real estate agent, there are several actions you can take right now. Number one is make sure that you take care of your customer. Say those three terms one more time for me, Jim. Surprise, delight, and dazzle. Surprise, delight, and dazzle. So here's the thing. Go surprise, delight, and dazzle your current relationships. Make sure that they understand that you are there for them, to take care of them, to serve them, and that you actually care about their well-being and not just their pocketbook. So that's the first thing. Next, like Jim said, is it's really, really easy to get into the places where those are that you want to serve. Like Jim said, you can go, you can join uh, different charitable organizations and serve there. You can join um, the social membership at a country club. I think you said, Jim, you're, you're paying 250 a month for that. That's incredible value for things like that. So go be where your people are. Act like the people are that you want to serve because you're already that person. So find these commonalities in these relationships and just surprise, delight, and dazzle them. 
over and over and over again. And that to Jim, in my interpretation, is the best way to serve people as a luxury real estate agent. Any final words there for our audience here, Jim? Yeah, one, I guess a, a couple of them, Gary, is um, not to take yourself too seriously. Uh, I mean, I understand uh, the place that I've come in life, and I'm very grateful for the successes that we've had. Uh, but man, I don't take myself too seriously. I don't read the I don't read the headlines. So make sure you're not reading the headlines if if uh, somehow you're thinking that all of a sudden you're really important. Really, the most important people that I know are are um, plumbers. Uh, so uh, if if I'm not a plumber, I'm not not in that category. Well, Jim, I just wanted to say uh, from the depth of my heart, thank you so much. I have a deep deep gratitude for you for showing up, for being here and sharing your knowledge and your expertise over the past 33 years of your career with everybody here talking about luxury real estate, but actually even diving deeper and talking about relationship management. How do you take care of your customers? How do you take care of your customers in a way that actually serves you as well? Because like a, an old friend, Brian Buffini said, hand it out in slices and it comes back in loaves. Yeah. And so with that, Jim, I just wanted to sign off and say, thank you so much. It has been a delight having you here with us. And I cannot wait to have you here again very, very soon. Thank One you, quick question for you, Jim. I think our audience is probably gonna wanna watch and follow your career, maybe emulate some of the things that you're doing. Where's the best place that they can follow you so they can see what you're doing? Well, I'm easy to find uh, on Facebook and Instagram, just my name. Uh, so I'm really easy to find. And I'd be delighted to engage in any type, of, any type of conversations that would be fun and useful for your audience. Go follow Jim Wahlberg on Facebook and Instagram. And with that, we can't wait to see you on the next episode. Thank you, Gary.